40 years ago to this very day, the scientists, engineers, and technologists of the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, PARC, debuted what was, in retrospect, one of the most important developments in computer history, the Alto system. The Alto system was the PARC ideal of personal distributed computing made real. It was an experimental system made by computing researchers intended to be a time machine, that is, tomorrow's computer. The park researchers were remarkably prescient. The thoroughly graphical, fundamentally networked idiom of the Alto became that for personal computing as we have come to know it. Xerox earned a fortune from the advent of laser printing at PARC in co-development with the Alto system. The broader computing sector earned even more. It's hard to underestimate the impact that encounters with the Alto had on people in computing from Bill Gates to Steve Jobs and many, many others. As Alan Kay, one of the key figures in the Alto story recently noted, the Alto system team numbered about 35 people, spent about 10 million in today's dollars, and ultimately led to trillions of dollars in wealth creation. Today we're reintroducing the Alto with some of the original park researchers providing demonstrations and discussion. We're relying on 40-year-old restored experimental computers, 40-year-old experimental software, and pioneers who are 40 years older. <laughs> what could go wrong? Well, we found out during sound check. Uh, but I think there's a lot of people we could call on in here for technical support. Um, there are too many people who made tonight possible for me to thank them all individually, but I'll try to thank them collectively by organization. Our deepest thanks go out to tonight's presenters, the museum staff and restoration community, PARC and its alumni, and Living Computers Museum and Labs. One of the hardest things about appreciating the Alto is to grasp how different it, it was from mainstream computing of its era. Have a look as we try to take you back in time to give a sense of how things were when the Alto came to be. America made it through the 60s. Welcome to the 70s. President Richard Nixon was forced from office by scandal. Investigations of this matter to an end. The Vietnam War raged on. While Americans took to the streets in pursuit of their rights, feminists opened the decade by working to revolutionize gender relations. And at the same time, a revolution in technology was underway. Intel released the first commercially successful microprocessor. A powerful, proprietary, general-purpose computer. Calculators shrank to fit in your pocket. Pong, the wildly popular table tennis arcade game, came to American living rooms. And at the newly opened Xerox lab in Palo Alto, top minds converged to create what Stanford professor Donald Knuth called the greatest by far team of computer scientists ever assembled in one organization. Under the leadership of networking pioneer Bob Taylor, researchers like computer designer Chuck Thacker and computer scientist Butler Lampson were chasing the future of what they called personal distributed computing. They wanted to create the office of the future, but really they created a time machine, a revolutionary system that was deliberately ahead of its time. It became the template for the personal computer as we know it. The Xerox Alto combined a high-resolution screen, a computer, a mouse, and a graphical user interface all in a single system. The Alto could file, schedule, communicate, and help plan. Tasks that kept an office running. Much of today's computing comes from this effort, including laser printing, the Ethernet, word processing, and much, much more. In 1977, exactly 40 years ago today, an internal PARC team presented the Alto to executives at an event called Futures Day. Their hope was to encourage commercial adoption of this technology. Today, we revisit yesterday's computer of tomorrow, the Alto, 
with demonstrations of its then revolutionary software by some of the people who made it possible. Our first demonstration will be of the pioneering word processor Bravo, presented by Tom Malloy and Charles Simonyi. Tom recently retired after 40 years in the computer industry. After his tenure at Park, he worked at Apple as a software developer for the Lisa and was chief software architect at Adobe Systems. Charles is a technical fellow at Microsoft. After working at Park, Charles joined Microsoft, where his organization developed products like Word and Excel. He rejoined Microsoft this year when it acquired his firm, Intentional Software, which he founded in 2002. Please join me in welcoming Tom and Charles. Thank you, David. Thanks for the introduction. So, uh, the Bravo story really started in 1974. I visited uh, Bottle Lampson's office and I noticed uh, three sheets of paper on his desk. And uh, these sheets of paper contained a, a rough, very rough sketch of a future editor for the Alto that was just coming to being. And I asked uh, Butler if he, if he could use some help. And he said yes. Uh, so this, um, besides some sketches about how to do selection and scrolling with the mouse, the, the original notes had to do with, uh, with a, a very uh, efficient uh, display algorithm, how to update the display using the, the special uh, display control blocks that the hardware and the firmware on the Alto was supporting. And it also created some very nice interfaces to, to what you might call a, a virtual memory for files, for efficient file access. So why this uh, emphasis on, on uh, efficiency at that time? Well, you have to realize that the Alto is about 1,000 to 10,000 times smaller in terms of its, its performance, its capability, than a desktop machine today. So we are talking about not 1% of today's capability, but 1% of that 1%. And that's, that's the, the, uh, uh, the domain that we had to work in and to delight our, our, our potential customers. So we keep, uh, quickly implemented the nodes uh, so step by step. And in, in each step, we were really um, delighted to see uh, how attractive the, the concepts were, the, con the, the selection, and, and so on and so forth. The, um, a big boost came from uh, Jay Moore. That, uh, he's the, the co-inventor of, of uh, the Boyer-Moore search algorithm. Uh, he was using piece tables in one of his programs. And the piece tables give you the capability of doing editing in essentially constant time as the user perceives it. So you could edit small things and big things essentially instantly. So that was very useful. And at, at that time, the Bravo core become a, a, a very attractive uh, uh, programming editor, if you will, uh, but also a very nice platform to do experimentation. In particular, uh, Larry Tesler, who are uh, with us tonight, um, experimented, uh, used uh, uh, Bravo to develop Gypsy and created uh, a very forward-looking and, and far-reaching uh, um, methodology for, for selections and moodless interfaces, and basically the, the cut, copy, paste model that we are all using today. But formatting, doing formatting was, was kind of a challenge. By ne early 1975, we finally figured out a, a, a long-term way for both for the, for the representation of formatting and also for the user model of formatting, which is still valid today. And this model basically says that you can associate an arbitrary amount of, of formatting information with every character and with every para paragraph in your document. And the representation guaranteed that you can do this without uh, um, undue costs. So when, when, uh, when formatting uh, was, was, uh, was completed, um, laser printing also appeared at pretty much at the same time. And laser printing, of course, gave, up, gave us the capability of printing formatting documents at typeset quality. So when you put these two things together, you have an editor that can create formatting and can create um, uh, correct copy, which is very important. And then you create a typeset 
quality output. And you can do this without any training. So that's when Bravo really become viral, as we would say today. What that means is that the, the, basically the, uh, the spouses of the researchers came in at night and they were doing things that was, were important for them. They did doctoral theses, they did um, uh, PTA reports, they did uh, uh, personal correspondence um, that was set, still sent by snail mail at the time. But this was all done in uh, typeset quality and with an error-free uh, error copy. So um, the, this is really the first ever production use, you might call the first ever production use of a personal computer. Uh, a, um, a, researcher, a, a, a researcher like Lois Lampson, who was studying, doing her doctoral thesis in, in bio, uh, uh, biochemistry, uh, she could create error-free, typeset quality thesis uh, by herself without any training. And when she submitted the required two copies to the registrar of her thesis, the registrar asked her to, to, to identify the original one, because that goes to the library. <laughs> and of course, there was no time to explain that there's no such thing as original anymore. So basically, they, they took one of them and called that the or original. And this is the, this is the time uh, the time of change. It's really a, a, a sea change in, in, in perception and in capability. And that's the time of change that we'd like to demonstrate to you. And um, we, uh, let's uh, look at the Bravo screen. The Bravo screen had a very simple user interface. Uh, it, it, uh, it was uh, uh, not pretty clunky to use, as you will see, but it was easy to learn. And it, it stayed in, in place. It, uh, has windows that are essentially horizontal, uh, that's, that's basically required by the, by the computer hardware and uh, the, the capability of the, of the auto. But um, um, we, we had a couple of, uh, of text buffers, which is very much like the, the uh, 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 very much like the, the cut and paste. Cut, no, well, it's, for, for, it's basically for cut and paste. So uh, with that. Take so, it away. So we're going to demonstrate uh, some of the features of Bravo here, and we'll try to focus on the things that are not so familiar, although I think you will see many familiar features uh, based on your experience with uh, modern user interfaces. This is a memo that Charles may, might have written uh, 40 years ago to the, <laughs> to the, to the Bravo team. Uh, that is the Bravo team on the two line, but the first thing I'm going to do is add myself and Butler Lampson to the CC line. And to do that, I press I to get into insert mode. Then I type in my name from the keyboard, and I hit escape to complete that insertion. Now, I could keep typing, but in order to demonstrate what I think is uh, one of the more novel features from uh, the Bravo days, if I hit A for append, I can go down here where I want Butler Lampson next, and you see that Butler's name is in the document already. By pressing the middle mouse button, I get a dotted underline rather than a solid underline to indicate a secondary selection. And when I press escape, Butler appears. It's moved into the insert location. <laughs> and then I'll just complete uh, that insertion there. Before we go any further, though, I noticed that I, I made a mistake in preparing the template, and uh, so I want to just fix this misspelling right here. You want to say editing? Uh oh, uh oh, what I got, happened? <laughs> this is what this this is what happens when you have a modal interface, and this is why we don't have, we have more modeless interfaces today. What happened was is that you failed to type I. Oh, of course. And all the, the, <laughs> the letters, letters E, D, I were interpreted as commands. So E extended the selection, D deleted everything, <laughs> and, uh, and the I inserted the rest of your text. But fortunately, we, we had undo. Can you do, we do an undo, I, please? I'll undo it, Charles. I'll undo. undo. So no, we don't even have that. Unfortunately, undo worked only on one. Uh, for one command. So I think. Wait, 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 wait. You wait, were wait. really host. Wait, 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 wait. I, I have one, one last way to recover here. So 
So I'm going to exit the Bravo program. And we had a feature which is also, I think, quite unusual historically. It's called the replay feature. So I'm going to restart Bravo in replay mode. And it is actually keystroke by keystroke going to re re recreate my session. So it's reading in the uh, template. It's inserting my name, inserting Butler's name. And I can hit space to stop the replay, because we don't want it to play all the way to the end, or we yeah. back where we started. Well, well th th that's a very important feature that you can stop, because this was actually used to debug the program. Often, of course, we had lots of failures, and, and, and it was very difficult to recreate what, what end users were doing. But with the replay feature, we had two things. One of them is that we could recreate the box so could, we could fix it. And then second, of course, we could save the end user's work. So uh, now you can see at the, on the top line it says stop before command number five. If I hit T now, we'll actually terminate the replay and we can resume the demo. Good. I think you are. The next thing we want to show you is some of the formatting commands of Bravo. So uh, I'm going to select uh, these paragraphs right here using the right hand mouse key to extend the selection. And then uh, all formatting was done with a set of commands called look commands. So the first thing I'm going to do is say look center, then look bold, and then the very intuitive command look nine <laughs> to select the uh, Helvetica 18 typeface. Uh, there were ten, we had 10 typefaces at our disposal. A typeface uh, included the point size, however, so it's a combination of, of uh, typefaces. It was a style. I beg your pardon? It was a style. That's right. Yeah, combination, yeah. So uh, there's uh, some examples of um, the kind of formatting you could do with Bravo. The last thing I'd like to do here is going down to this paragraph. Uh, you notice most of the, the memo is justified, but I'm going to justify the last paragraph. And then just to uh, punch it up a little for Charles's benefit to the team, I'll hit Insert. Control B, while you're in Insert mode, will also put it in boldface. Oh, uh, that's how we do it today. That's right. And all this is the line wrapping. And, then, and that's Butler's algorithm. That's right. The, uh, the justification is maintained on a, on a keystroke by keystroke basis. And there we have uh, a simple one page memo. But we could actually work with much larger documents. We're going to bring in the Bravo manual right now. That's about a 40 page document, isn't it? That's right. Uh, carriage return. <laughs> and all we want to demonstrate here is uh, the scrolling, which was also similar but not identical to the way scrolling is done today. We go to the far left of the screen rather than have a scroll bar on the, what's typically on the right. And if we use the left mouse button, we scroll the line which is adjacent to the cursor to the top of the screen. So if I do that again, introduction moves to the top. And you'll notice, if you watch carefully, the only lines that get recomputed are the ones at the bottom. We're, we're just moving those lines up. I can reverse that with the right mouse button, bringing the top line down to the cursor. And then we have thumbing, as you would expect today, but it's slightly different. Uh, I can drag this thumb around to go all the way to the bottom of the document. Well, it's very much like the elevator today. That's right. Or to the top, or anywhere in between. I'm going to be tweeting tomorrow to describe some of the data structures that make this possible. <laughs> and for our last document, Charles, you yeah. want to talk about the- Well, in this time frame, uh, we were asked to make uh, demonstrations for, for, for VIPs and prospective customers of Xerox. And we developed a routine for these demonstrations. 
that, of course, we worked with the MAMO and with the nice typefaces, and of course, we printed it at the high resolution printer to show that the, the, the typeset quality of the result, and then we showed them the printout. But to reinforce the point, we also printed it ahead of time on a foil, foil like this used for view graphs. And then uh, we put the foil in front of the screen <laughs> to show the similarity. And for in one of these demonstrations, an exe executive for First National Citibank, he said that this reminds him of laughing, where one of the catchphrases is, what you see is what you get. <laughs> and we said, exactly, that's a fantastic description of it. And we kept repeating it, and then the, the catchphrase got uh, abbreviated into an acronym, and then uh, moved into the dictionary. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tom and Charles. Uh, while we transition to our next presenter, have a look at this historical demonstration of the Alto program, Icarus, by the museum's own Doug Fairbairn. Doug is showing us a specialized application, but an enormously important one, a program we call Icarus, which is used to design circuits, electronic circuits of the kind on which Alto depends. A feature of Icarus is its ability to enlarge any part of the drawing for easier design work. Another virtue is its ability to replicate a portion of a design. Once drawn, it's easily repeated when the design calls for it. We're still exploring new uses for Alto. As we said, it's all in the software, the programming, and we're continually exploring new applications. Our second demonstration will be with Bob Sproul, showing us two graphics programs, Draw and Markup. Bob recently retired as Vice President and Director of Oracle Labs. After his tenure at Park, Bob was, among other things, a professor at Carnegie Mellon, a leader at Sun Labs, and a principal of Sutherland, Sproul & Associates. Please join me in welcoming Bob. Thank, thank you, David. As you've heard, Park's charge was to invent the Office of the Future. And being Xerox, the Office of the Future, of course, had to have documents. And we know the best documents have graphical illustrations. So my assignment tonight is to demonstrate two Alto programs for making graphical illustrations for documents. The first is Draw, a program by Patrick Baudelaire for making drawings with lines, curves, and text. And the second is Markup by William Newman to make bitmapped images by painting with artificial brushes that can have special properties. Unfortunately, neither Patrick nor William could be here tonight to show you their work. But before starting the demo, I want to take you back 45 years or so to 1973, those of you who can survive that, and remind you that computer graphics meant line drawings then. Let's have the first slide, please. So some graphics display hardware showed exquisite drawings, far more exquisite than this one, I should say, but at a cost three times the annual salary of an engineer, let alone of an office worker. Next slide. Here's a woman using a pen and a tablet to edit the drawing of an electronic circuit. These displays weren't common, and you had to share. Next slide. You could also print things uh, using plotters that jerked a pen around on a sheet of paper. Next slide. In the late 60s, researchers started using techniques for creating raster images, defined by specifying the color of many thousands of dots arranged in a very tight rectangular grid. Here's a picture of a face represented by some 3D polygons rendered by coloring several hundred thousand dots, which today we call pixels. But this picture was not made on an interactive display. It was produced over many minutes by exposing film in a high-resolution camera. One of the technologies that made the Alto possible was computer memory chips, brand new at the time. Cheaper memory made it possible to store in memory the color of several thousand pixels and redraw the screen repeatedly from memory, and that's what you've been seeing on the Alto. Next slide. The Alto screen showed about a half a million pixels, about 72 to the inch, each of which was either black or white. It was enough to show a somewhat degraded image of a page 
of a letter, as you've seen in the Bravo demo, although things were in the right place, they were not as crisp and sharp as they would be on a, printed on a page. A color television screen showed about 300,000 pixels, each of which could take on many colors, but of course you need more memory to specify more colors. When you change the memory, you change the picture. Memories used to control raster displays, so-called frame buffer memories, were just starting to be built. Next slide. Dick Schaup built a color frame buffer at Park in 1973. He and colleagues developed SuperPaint, a program to emulate and extend painting by using pen input to drag colored brushes around the screen. And this is the system displaying the menu of SuperPaint commands. Raster images, of course, required raster printers. Gary Starkweather at Park invented the laser scanning technology that convert uh, Xerox copiers into raster document printers. Next slide. This is actually a schematic diagram done on SuperPaint to show how the basics of how a laser printer worked. S slot stands for scanned laser output terminal. We're not demonstrating printers tonight, but the Alto document creation tools could print on a variety of high resolution printers developed at Park. The Computer History Museum has one of Park's Dover printers. Next slide. So now for some slides to show what our illustration could soft software could do. And here you're going to see them at full printed resolution, whereas in a moment you'll see only the screen resolution. Here's a page with some text and a drawing in color. Text by Bravo, which you just saw. Drawing by uh, Draw, which you're about to see, merged by another program. The page was printed in 1977 on a Xerox 6500 color copier outfitted with a laser scanner to expose the drum. Note that the resolution used to print the page greatly exceeds that of the Alto displaying the image, which you'll see in a moment. Next slide. And finally, to give all our tools a challenge, tools a challenge William Newman and I used them in 1979 to create camera-ready copy for the second edition of our graphics text. Here we have drawings by draw and uh, text by a program that Larry Tesler wrote, who's here tonight, merging by other tools. Make note of the top illustration because you will see it again shortly. Pages were printed by an experimental laser scan printer at 768 dots per inch on glossy paper, which the printer then used to make offset printing plates. So now I'd like to turn our attention to the screen and to show you draw. So you're looking at the screen when it comes up. And you'll notice first on the left here a series of icons. And these are the commands that I can use to make to, to cause diagrams to be drawn. And my cursor shows a, a small version of one of the commands. It's this plus sign. And plus signs are used to lay down endpoints of lines. So I just created a line. Now, maybe I didn't like the, the, uh, the, the way that line was so thin and wispy, so I can redraw it with a wider brush. Notice the brush icon. I, I used it down here. I selected a, a rounded brush and a wider, a wider one. Maybe it was a little too wide, so I can draw it again. Um, I can continue to draw points by going back to my plus. I can, when I lay a point down, I can select a point that's on an existing uh, line with the middle mouse, like so. Or, if I wish, if I have very structured things to do, I can display a grid. You may be able to see a whole lot of small dots there showing grid points. And I can use a, a, the third mouse button to lay down points on the grid. Oops, didn't do it right. There we go. Now, and, and in particular, the uh, draw takes care to join points at so that here you see a rounded brush, and notice the corners look rounded. If instead I used a square brush, uh, the corners look square. So now I mentioned curves, and after all, the real point of draw is curves. So curves are made by laying down several points that you want a curve to, to lie on. And this is called, these are so-called natural splines that are fitted to the, the points that I have provided. Let's, let's redraw that in a somewhat more attractive way. Um, and I can create curves of a variety of sorts. I'm not particularly artistically inclined, so I can't show you everything very pretty, and we don't have time anyway. 
But another example of curves, I'm sorry, I should say first that you can control the shape of things by how, where you place the, these points called knots. Here I've placed two rather close together, and this will cause the curve to turn more sharply at that point. It takes some training practice to get used to figuring out where to place the knots so as to uh, get the curve you want. Another class of curves are so-called closed curves, which uh, meet back at the place they started. And here's one. Um, yeah, that, yeah, well. <laughs> Now, one advantage of using geometric definitions for drawings is that you can, uh, you can make changes. So for example, if you wanted to have a separate, a second copy of that curve, I can do that and make as many copies as I wish. Or if I wanted to, for example, uh, enlarge it, I can use, use uh, four points here I t to make a corresponding uh, change from an original to, to an, in this case, an enlargement, and I could copy that as many times as I wanted as well. Now, of course, most people um, weren't very adept at drawing arbitrary things, and so it was very useful to be able to have files that had symbols in them. Here's a file that contains circle parts, uh, a full circle and a quarter circle and a half circle, and maybe I really wanted to just use it uh, just use the full circle so I can delete with the X command, the erase command. Now I've got just a full circle, and as I've shown you before, I could change the brush used for that. But in this case, I really just want to start by changing the size, and I can do that as I did a moment ago, except I forgot to select the curve. I, you know, I made that every, error every time in, do, in doing this demo. <laughs> But luckily, it has the same effect, which is to do nothing. So there's the curve. And again, if I wanted to make copies, for example, placed in various spots, I could, um, in this case, I can even arrange that they abut each other by using that, that second mouse button that use, finds points already on curves. Uh, there's also the ability to put in text. You'll see text of appearing at the bottom. And I can place that wherever I wish, and if I didn't like where that is, I can select it and then use the same command I used to move a curve to move it to a different spot. And I can change the font that it's in and place it again. Whoops, place it again. Oh, I have to, yeah. There's, there it is in bold. Okay, now just to continue, to, to finish, Here is that uh, illustration on the page that, from our book that I asked you to pay attention to as it was drawn in Draw. And uh, of course, it's, it's uh, I can, let's see, I can manipulate pieces of it or the whole thing just like I've been showing you. So here's a much enlarged version. And in fact, working on it big and then making it small for the final version was a common technique. So that ends my, my demonstration of draw. So now I'd like to show you a comp quite different program. So markup, which was done by William, was a paint program. And you remember the idea of a frame buffer is you have, in this case, 500,000 dots or so. Your job in making a drawing is only to figure out which ones you want white and which ones you want black. Very simple. <laughs> only 500,000 is a little much. So the screen is blank because the whole screen is a drawing. And, but I do have a cursor. And one of the innovations here was William decided to make the menu pop up when you pressed a button down. So that's the entire menu. But you may have noticed that it only came up as I moved the mouse over different parts of it. So for example, at the moment, whoops, I did a bad thing. I just told it to quit. Well, we'll start again. Shouldn't be so, uh, quite so glib. Okay. 
So I've chosen a brush here. Well, actually, let's start with a simple brush. Here's a little tiny dot, and I could draw, but you know, the mouse isn't a very good drawing implement, and I'm not a very good drawing person, and so the combination is rather crude. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I can make mischief big, big time with a bigger brush, or I can also erase, use a brush to erase things, and so on. Well, all right. Uh, but this is an image, essentially image-oriented uh, program, so I can select a piece of the screen, and actually this gets erased, but then gets saved in memory so I can copy it and, re and place it again as many times as I wish. And again, if, if I were more artistically inclined, those, those copies would mean something, but they don't here. <laughs> now, some of the brushes have special properties. This one that with a cross stays on a grid, and when I move around corners, it closes the corners properly. So if I wanted to make things like block diagrams, this is perfect. Uh, and I have several different sizes um, that I can use this. And erasing works in the same way, so that if I make a mistake, I can go back and fix it again. And the corners are generally filled in. And then there are some brushes that not, go not only ho horizontal and vertically, but at angles. And again, the corners are filled in. So, and, and, and again, you know, as withdraw, I can enter, enter some text. And, um, and I guess I can move it around too somehow. I can, I can place it, in, I can place copies in many different places. So finally, I'd like to um, show you another aspect of the menu. There's some other, these are other files on my machine, including one that I happen to know has an illustration in it. And I can, I've just selected it, and now it is available to place wherever I wish. It turns out it's not a very interesting illustration, but it is, trust me, um, just a bitmapped image that happens to have been in another file. As I said, as I showed you in for draw, I could have put special symbols in that file and then been able to call them up in this way. So I want to now quit and show you an example of a, um, of a full page il illustration that was actually done by somebody who knew what they were doing, <laughs> namely William. This is another, this is an illustration from our book that was actually created to show the, the value of bitmap representation of, of images. Uh, and so it's coming up about as fast as the disk on the Alto can deliver the bits. And this is an illustration that shows markup in action. This is actually created from a photograph. This is a picture of William's son, Damien. And it was created using a particular kind of stippling half-toning algorithm. And then the rest of this was just showing a particular series of transformations that you could make on the image. Uh, so that's it. That's draw and markup. Thanks so much, Bob. Uh, while we prepare for the next demonstration, take a look at this Xerox commercial, Imagining the Office of the Future. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You come into your office, grab a cup of coffee. Good morning, Brad. And a Xerox machine presents your morning mail on a screen. What's the mail this morning? This one looks interesting. Let's uh, take a look at this. I'm going to need a couple of copies of this. Push a button, and the words and images you see on the screen appear on paper. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Fred. You know, Fred, I think everybody on the routing list should see this. Push another button, and the information is sent electronically to similar units around the corner or around the world. This is an experimental office system. It's in use now at the Xerox oh, Research fine. Center in Palo Alto, California. Soon, Xerox systems like this will help you manage your most precious resource, information. Okay, Anything else? Flowers. Well, what flowers? My anniversary. I forgot. Our third demonstration this evening is with Doug Brotz, presenting the email client Laurel. Doug is a fellow at Adobe Systems. 
Immediately on the heels of his time at Park, Doug became Adobe's first software employee, where he made many diverse contributions, particularly with PostScript. Please join me in welcoming Doug. The Alto was a combination of small computer, a network connection, bitmap display, and mouse. Email turns out to be the perfect application to use all of the Alto, from its user interface to read and write messages, through cooperating servers to transport the messages from one user to another. Michael Schroeder, Ben Wegbright, and Roger Needham began this project. I joined weeks in, and I quickly became responsible for all the interactive features that you see here. What you see on the screen is what a brand new user is instructed to type in order to learn how to use the Laurel program. It's amazing. The emulator that we have running on the Macintosh runs about five times faster than the real Alto. <laughs> Now, at Xerox, we did not invent email. I want to dispel that evil notion right now. <laughs> what we did was make it usable and inviting for everyone, not just hardcore computer people, but for executives, secretaries, lawyers, librarians, everybody. This display screen should look familiar to everybody in this audience, whether you use Laurel at Xerox or not. And the reason is that every email program that has been used since has borrowed from this model. I mean, could this be anything else than an email program? What we have up here is a table of contents of messages that you've received. In the middle, we have an area where you can display the messages. And at the bottom, we have an area where you can uh, type in and edit messages you want to send to someone else. So we're absolutely brand new user. We know nothing except how to move a mouse. So by just looking at this screen, we see, hmm, OK, this says to start your tutorial session, point cursor at display and click the left mouse button. Well, we'll give it a try. Oh, we're starting to learn how to use this program. It tells us, among other things, that there are certain conventions that you already know from using Bravo. For instance, how to scroll. So we have exactly the same system with, the, with our cursor over on the left edge. We can scroll up or down. We did our thumb uh, operation in a different manner. We actually put the thumb bar between the messages. But this somehow never caught on with the rest of the world. So it's an interesting artifact. Of, of what we did. So this will tell us that we can continue to read subsequent messages by just pointing at display again. And we're now going through all the messages in this tutorial file and learning how to use every aspect of the, of the program. Now there's one command here I'd like to draw your attention to, which you may already have focused on, there's a very peculiar word right in the middle of the screen. It's called undelete. That's not English. <laughs> but understand that this program made its debut 
with a population of people who were not computer people. If anyone here has a parent whom you've tried to teach a computer thing to, you would understand this. Because they all say, I'm going to hurt something. It, I'm going to break something. Well, to delete a message, you merely point at it and say delete. But it's not really deleted. It's just marked for deletion. If you made a mistake, you can undelete it. And this went a very long way in making this system very inviting for all the users. So we're looking at a self-documenting system. This is undoubtedly not the first self-documenting system, but I believe it's the most natural one. You're actually using Laurel to document itself. Now, let's start editing a message to send to somebody else. So I'll go down to the Compose message window. Oh, maybe I want a little more room down here, so I'll just change the uh, size of the window. And I'll go in here and start typing some kind of text, like to score and five years ago. Well, that's what this is all about, right? <laughs> we borrowed the conventions of editing from Bravo. The original version of Laurel used the modal editor that Charles and Tom uh, were demonstrating. They were showing you that one because apparently the emulator that we were using had a bug and it could not actually show the better editor, uh, which was the modeless version of Bravo. Uh, and of course, you all know how the modeless version of Bravo works because you know it as Microsoft Word. <laughs> now, oh, oh, I'm lying. <laughs> we put in a couple of other editing conventions uh, you saw the secondary uh, editing, uh, the secondary selection technique from Bravo in the modal editor. Well, we put in a thing called shift selection. So if you're at a particular insertion point, all you have to do is go and grab something else with your selection while you're holding the shift key down. When I let up on the shift key, voila, it all gets copied. I don't know why this hasn't made it big, but <laughs> what can you do? Well, let's go, let's, you know, I'm starting to feel a little bit ornery, and I have a, I have a real urge to send a different kind of message. So I'm gonna, oh, I put it in the wrong place, so I'm just gonna have to do uh, undo. And I really want this to be two, whoops, to all America. A distribution list I happen to have. <laughs> and I'm going to start typing uh, some, something in here. Um, and I'm, you know, maybe, maybe I'll put, make this about 140 characters long. <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm a, about to pull the trigger and uh, hit the deliver button, but wait a minute. Um, everywhere the Alto went, Laurel went with it. And we developed a very large community of users. They weren't just computer people. Email prior to Laurel was confined to hardcore computer people who were all of a particular culture. 
we wanted to use email to get our work done. But once everybody was using it, it turned out that people were using this in all kinds of new ways. And we discovered that there were a number of sociological phenomena that we had never seen before. Well, I cataloged quite a few of these phenomena, and I included them in the second version of the Laurel Manual, which you can actually get online. If you go to Amazon, you can pay somebody $65 for one. <laughs> Or if you just put it into Google, say Laurel Manual, CSL-81-6, I believe there's a copy in the back of the room, you'll find some guy who's just got it in PDF and you can, cop you can download it. If you read chapter six, you'll see the world's first etiquette manual for internet communication. Well, you know, I guess I'll have to take my own advice and not push that deliver button. Just get rid of this thing. Of course, not everybody has read the manual. <laughs> now, I, I can't really show you much of this, but I do, would like to talk a little bit about this last command down here called run. This is a command that we put in for the last version of Laurel uh, called Laurel 6, which is the one we're showing up here. Oh, if you can read all of this little print, by the way, it looks like somebody named Taylor from Palo Alto is actually uh, operating this thing. Uh, now, the run command was a way to run other programs. It turns out that this particular individual, Taylor, always had Laurel on his computer. And sometimes he needed to do something else. So without having to leave Laurel, he could run another program. This is now called a plug-in. Uh, this, once again, probably not the world's first plug-ins, but really easy to use. Uh, the initial idea was to have a program where you could edit distribution lists. After all, that's a very email kind of thing. But one day, a certain individual named John Warnock, who was a researcher at Park, came to me and he said, you know, we have this little program called JAM, which stands for John and Martin, Martin being Martin Newell. And it was a program where you could describe a graphic image in a programming language. And you could send this text that described an image and somebody else could actually make the image. He said, wouldn't that be great if we could run this in Laurel and then we could send images to each other? So I worked with him, it took about an hour, and we had jam, jam.laurel running in Laurel and we were sending images to each other. I would like to point out that this little interaction, uh, as Rick Blaine said to Captain Raynaud, this was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. <laughs> but of course, that's a story for another symposium. So I'm just going to quit from this thing. Oh, I have to quit from, from, from uh, the run command and say thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Doug. Uh, as we transition over to the next demonstration, listen to some remarks by Alan Kay, one of the key players in the Alto story. This is Park. Um, this is the time to give the tribute to Bob Taylor. He actually deserves another one, so I'll say a few more words. Um, now, you notice, let's see if there's one before that. Okay, this is a typical uh, way Park was organized. It was organized this way because Bob, uh, I think had two goals in mind. One is he wanted to be different, he wanted it to be comfortable, and I think he'd also discovered that it was impossible to leap to your feet to denounce anybody when you were sitting in a beanbag chair. <laughs> this is a photograph, I believe, as far as I can tell, it, it's marked April 72, 73, and that is exactly the right 
time for it, for uh, th this to be the actual photograph of the first Alto screen. I think it was the very day that Steve Purcell got this image up there, uh, no, not, not more than a few hours after uh, Butler, and, I mean, uh, Chuck and Ed and Larry uh, had finished debugging the thing. So that was the start of um, an era of the most tremendous fun I've ever had in my life. Our final demonstration is of the programming language and environment Smalltalk, presented by Dan Engels. Dan is the principal architect of five generations of Smalltalk, beginning with his crucial work at Park. Most recently, Dan worked at Y Combinator on his latest software environments, the Lively Kernel and the Lively Web. Please join me in welcoming Dan. Thank you. I'm going to start by, uh, with a live demonstration of the Smalltalk 76 system. Well, let me just type something here. <clears throat> and Smalltalk 76 uh, had evolved from some of our earlier Smalltalk work into what became sort of the archetype for an integrated development environment. So it includes uh, um, uh, interactive text, um, multi-font text, um, a source level um, browsing system, and debugging, and inspectors, and other tools. Um, and I'm just going to take a quick run through. Um, as with all of our software, we tried to keep everything as sort of live and interactive as possible. So for instance, wherever there was text, you could ask it to be evaluated. And we got pop-up menus. We had done a lot of work with graphics. And, um, and you'll see these are like modern pop-up menus. <clears throat> the screen goes black there because this was sort of for geeky development. And it turns out that the Alto runs faster when it's not displaying its full screen. So, uh, <laughs> um, so that things seem to be working. That has actually tested a great deal of the system because it took that text, compiled it, entered it into the system as a method, and then sent a message to evaluate it. Um, here I'll take something a little bit more, uh, a little bit more challenging thing, 20 factorial. <clears throat> and in the Smalltalk system, there are uh, small integers, um, but also there are general uh, large precision, you know, extended precision integers. So you can see that's a very big result. And uh, we tried to keep things as general as possible. And uh, let's take a look at how factorial actually works. Um, here's the, uh, it, we've got a category in the system of numbers. This, this is online access to all the software, all the uh, software that's running in the system. And we see that uh, here we've got class number, <clears throat> but also there are a number of other classes here which, which inherit from number. So there's regular integers, those are uh, small valued ones. There's the large integers that were used to compute that result. Um, and several other things like dates and times, which also uh, can do numerical things such as uh, comp comparison and, uh, and things like that. Uh, if I go here, then here uh, I, I've gone to the category of arithmetic, and I can look at the factorial message. <clears throat> and I'll take just a minute to, uh, to show you, you know, how we wrote that. It's, this involved having uh, a new language as well as a new evaluator. And so you'll need to understand a little bit about how it works. <clears throat> Everything's done by sending messages. So this is uh, self, in this case, is receiving the message factorial. And what this means is if I myself am equal to 0, and that's done by saying send equal to me with, with the argument 0, um, then return 1. Otherwise, return myself times the factorial of myself minus 1. So what's notable about this is that in conventional programming at the time, um, n none of this would have worked for both small integers and large integers. But in this case, each of these things that's like the equal test, um, the, the multiplication, the subtraction, those were all sent as messages so that uh, this method actually works regardless of what the type of the, uh, of the receiver is. Um, and <clears throat> It's fun reviving a system like this, because uh, you can do things like uh, number, 
Um, I can go into the, oh, let's see, I've, let me just, uh, sorry, I mistyped something. Our, our text editor is modeless. <laughs> the only way to go. Um, So I could go and, and, int, and probe into the system and ask for the method for factorial and then ask for it as bytes if I happen to want to do that. And there it is, the actual bytecodes for that method, which uh, probably wouldn't be that interesting to you unless you were doing research on Smalltalk 76. <laughs> <laughs> but if you were curious, you could find out because the system is all live and the whole meta system is running all the time. So for instance, um, let me cancel that <clears throat> and we can go to the kernel classes. And this is where classes are described and the inheritance and how it works. But even the, uh, even the, uh, the execution of every procedure um, created a stack frame, and the stacks, stack frames, we call them contexts, were live so that you could actually look at them. And that made it incredibly easy to build a debugger for this system. But I'm going to go in, in the category for simulation. And if you have an object that represents the stack frame <clears throat> and, and you want to advance it, say, in the debugger or if, uh, and simulate how the system works, um, you would send it this message, step. And uh, it's a big piece of code. I'll just say a couple of words about it. But it says, advance the program counter, advance the PC to be PC plus one. Go into the method and pull out the byte that's there, OK? And then dispatch on it, see what its value is, and do this or this or this or that. So here is actually the, the entire, the entire uh, description of how the Smalltalk virtual machine works. And this is actually how Smalltalk 76 was created, because uh, we first wrote this method in Smalltalk 74. And we got it all working. It was very slow, uh, but we got it all working. And then, uh, then we wrote microcode for it, and it runs the way it does now. Um, so, uh, so we had a lot of fun with this system just being able to try stuff out very easily. Um, I'll show you like the, just the ease of doing some graphic things, like uh, you could say rectangle, give me a new one, and uh, from user, uh, take its uh, dimensions from me, and then comp it. Comp uh, was short for complement, uh, meaning turn it, uh, turn it black on white or white on black. Let me do that. So if I just evaluate that while the system's running, <clears throat> it prompts me with a cursor, and I can draw out a rectangle just anywhere on the screen. And there we have that, um, which isn't that interesting, but it did what I wanted. Um, uh, I, can, I can do the same thing again. And if I do it by, it by a slight offset <clears throat> that way, I see, ooh, this is a cheap way to put a, um, a border around a rectangle. Um, and, and that relates to one of the things that, uh, that was a problem working with some end users with our system and with some of the other uh, Alto systems, which is that normal people, when you make a large selection, get a little bit scared by this big black hole in their screen. And mightn't it be nicer instead to draw an outline around instead of turning it all black? So let's take a look at what it would take to do that. Um, let me uh, cancel here. And we'll go down to uh, another part of the system. Um, uh, this is the text image. <clears throat> and it's got a category called selection. And there are various uh, methods in there. This one called Comprect will uh, reverse things from black to white. You can see it takes the rectangle and says comp. Um, but I could add to that code another line that would say um, r copy um, translate 
Uh, oops. Translate. Oh, just a second. By one. And uh, this little operation is pronounced make a point one. Uh, so that makes an xy coordinate pair that's an offset. Um, and we'll tell that to comp. OK? And now I'll recompile this. So we're down in the deepest part of the system here, making a recompilation. But recompilations are always fast in a message-oriented system because there's no need to relink everything. Messages do that automatically. And now I make this selection, and ooh, look at that. <laughs> and amazingly, amazingly, it actually ex extends to another area. Um, it might be nicer, really, to have that uh, offset be 2, just to show how you know, um, development goes so fast um, when everything just responds immediately. Uh, we often said that uh, <clears throat> the Smalltalk systems ran at about a quarter the speed of other systems that our competing labs were building, um, but the turnaround time for change was like a tenth or less. Um, so now let's see what we've got. Yeah, that's sort of nicer. Okay. Um, so uh, that's you know about how easy it is to do development in the system. I thought I'd just show. Uh, um, in addition to overlapping windows and, uh, and pop-up menus, we also had um, a sort of a variant on windows, which, which some people called doors, which is you could go into uh, separate worlds here and enter them. So you could actually have um, sort of all of your projects organized in this, in this universe. And uh, here's a project in which uh, we're doing a little bit of graphics editing. And this is to show that <clears throat> we did also do those things. Um, and this particular editor uh, was uh, quite a while before a lot of other bitmap editors. Um, but for instance, it's actually got a fat bits mode, and I could go this, uh, this finger on the, uh, on the instrument just always looked to me a little bit flattened where it shouldn't be. So let me just uh, try to make a change to that. Here's the, here's the fat bits editor, and I can go in with the mouse and, uh, and turn this to be white. And like everything else we did, we tried to keep it live. So you'll see it's actually changing the, uh, the main picture while I do this. OK? And that. Okay. So now you can, you can start the video. Um, I'm going to show uh, videos for the rest here, um, some other work that we did uh, that used the power of the Alto microcode. Um, this is an animation system <clears throat> that we did. Here's, uh, we're drawing a, drawing a ball here. And, uh, and then the animation system itself also puts up an iconic menu. And here we've traced a curve for it. And now we set it to run that curve. And you see the ball bouncing. But we'd like to make it splay out at the bottom. It would be more effective if it did that. So we go into step mode and take a copy of that, the ball at that point so that we have it there so that we can do our, our new image at where it should be in the animation. So we've got live on the left, and we're doing the editing on the right. And you see there, there's the squashed ball appearing, OK? That was done. Uh, uh, by Alan and, and some guys who came down from uh, Canada. <clears throat> Here's the animation system at full speed with about 30 sprites, the cookie monster gobbling cookies, and a flying horse, of course. <laughs> um, we got into doing uh, music synthesis uh, just because we could, and we all like music. Um, so uh, we worked on wavetable synthesis, which is we could get actually 10 voices in real time using the Alto's microcode. Um, but then uh, Steve Saunders, who was a student with us, figured out a way to get frequency modulated sounds, which is, it gives you a whole other set of sounds that you can do. And here's a, a timbre editor where we're choosing different, uh, different ratios of the modulation to get these different sounds. And then here's a real-time display <clears throat> being synthesized with uh, four voices in a Bach fugue.
And you'll hear some more of that synthesis at the very end being played live. <clears throat> but a big part of our focus and Alan's passion and Adele's also was to teach and learn what we could um, from kids learning to use small talk. Um, and this is, these are girls from a class at Jordan Junior High who worked, we had the basement at Hillview set up. There's Adele. Um, she was a great coach, very insightful and challenging. Um, and, uh, and these kids got so excited by working with graphics and music. Um, I think you can, you can see the intention here on their face. Yeah, do it. Um, so that's Marion Goldin. She's actually uh, not just making polygons, but making a tool that makes polygons as, a, as an artistic tool. Um, this, and I thought it'd be nice to uh, f finish up with a tour around uh, that basement uh, classroom. Um, the the uh, song here is the theme song of our group, The Happy Hacker, which was, uh, let's, let's keep the sound up, um, which was uh, written, written, composed, and is being played live by Chris Jeffers. Please turn the sound up. Thanks. And you'll see the organ, there's the organ keyboard that was fed actually into the bits of the alto. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, j just to go off script uh, very, very briefly, I, I think Marion was planning to be here tonight. Uh, oh, oh Marion, there you are. Well, yeah, we just saw you on the screen. Um, uh, while we shift to our concluding presentation, please enjoy these remarks by some of the key alto players who were not able to be with us tonight. Sadly, we recently lost both Bob Taylor and Chuck Thacker. Now, in my view, perhaps the single greatest change, move, benefit throughout the history of computing came when we learned how to make computers interactive. The difference between um, using a computer interactively and punching holes in cards is night and day. I mean, it's just, it's indescribable. So what was an alto? Well, there is one. It was personal, right? It was probably the first personal computer. But I think the most important thing about the alto was that it was a platform, right? And people, I, I think, hadn't quite understood at that time what the enormous power of a platform is. I mean, the PC is a platform. The Palm is a platform. And if you have a platform, then you get all kinds of interesting things built on top of your platform. So all these things put together made a pretty reasonable suite of software for producing documents. And of course, in some sense, that was the business that Xerox wanted to be in when they talked about the electronic office. And that was the charter, Chuck didn't actually say this, but that was the charter they gave to, to uh, our part of Park in 1970, which was to uh, invent the electronic office. And nobody really had any idea what that meant. I'm quite certain that they didn't know what it meant, and I'm quite certain that we didn't know what it meant. But I think the Alto actually delivered pretty well on that, as well as some other things. John Schock will now share with us additional computing achievements of the Alto system. During his time at Xerox PARC, John is perhaps best known for his work on Ethernet, the PUP protocol, and the first computer worm. He's currently a general partner at Alloy Ventures, which he co-founded in 1996, and is a trustee of the museum. Please join me in welcoming John to the stage. Thank you, David. I, 
I have to keep reminding myself this is 40-year-old hardware, 40-year-old software. I'm glad my kids aren't here because all they'd say is, Dad, what's the big deal? Mac write, Mac, Mac paint, Mac draw, Outlook, Java. We've seen all this before. And, but as I said, I'd, I'd have to explain to them the machines are twice as old as they are, and they still worked. Anyways, thank you, David. I'm, a, I'm not a computer historian, but uh, in the words of those two great computer historians, Ron Popeil and Billy Mays, uh, my job is to get up here and say, but wait, there's more. Um, we've, we've seen live demos of real software running. I'm going to try to cover some things which uh, we're not going to try to demonstrate live. I'm going to talk a little bit about additional applications that took advantage of the Alto graphical user interface, which is its most visible manifestation and what the software shows us. But beyond that, I want to talk a little bit about things including the software development tools and most importantly, the distributed client server environment that was built. Um, there are really two threads that I'd just like to reiterate that led to this demo today, uh, one of which, of course, is some of the people who couldn't be here today, including Chuck Thacker, John Ellenby, and Bob Taylor, who we lost in the last year or two. Uh, let me make clear, however, that Butler, Lampson, and Alan Kay are alive and kicking, and they unfortunately had travel and teaching obligations and couldn't join us today. And let me commend to you the excerpt from Chuck Thacker and Butler Lampson uh, is a video that's available, if you can find it on YouTube, uh, that was recorded in an event for the Computer History Museum. And we haven't talked very much in this, in this presentation about the underlying hardware of the Alto. We're really focused on the software and the manifestation that people can see. Um, but we wanted to sort of have an opportunity to bring everybody together you know, while we can. And that was coupled with the evolution of three restoration projects for the Alto that I'd like to recognize. Um, an effort here at the Computer History Museum Software Center led by Al Caso, a group that had worked on the IBM 1401 restoration um, that is then working on a machine from Allen that they have up and running, and the Living Computer Museum in Seattle, which has the resources not only to restore the machine, but to keep them running. And if you were in Seattle, I commend to you the opportunity to go see these as they actually work. Um, let me also spend a word or two on the impact of live demos like this and, and other ones that have come before it in our lives. Um, some of you will have had the good fortune to be at some of these, the so-called mother of all demos by SRI showing the online system, the first real system with a mouse in a huge demonstration in San Francisco. Doug Engelbart and his team had a tremendous impact on everybody. Uh, Xerox Futures Day, this is 40 years ago to the day. This was an internal demonstration in Boca Raton for Xerox management, which had a tremendous impact within the corporation as it led to efforts to commercialize this. And of these three that I'm mentioning, the smallest demo, but the one that perhaps had the greatest impact, was a pair of demos to Steve Jobs in 1979 at Park. And, and you know, when I think about these demos, they're, they're important for a couple dimensions. They're, they're forcing functions that you've got to, of course, get everything to work, which is useful. Uh, they're also important because of the impact on people and events that follow from them. And they're also important because they're markers in time. You know, did that work get done in time for the demo in Boca? Was that before or after Steve came to see the tour? And we've seen the impact of his tour. Now, by the way, this stuff wasn't secret, and, and it, it took the live demo and the aha moment to recognize this is what you could do on a computer with the Lisa or the Mac. And by the way, if he knew where to look, he could have seen a lot of this information two years prior to it. You know, in 1977, much of the stuff on small talk that Dan showed was in an article in Scientific American. And if you're a real history buff and you're willing to go back to 1972, there's a great piece in Rolling Stone that I'll show you in a moment that shows the use of the mouse. And so the moral of the story is that impact, the impact of demos, that demos can have on the decisions and what people uh, pursue. Uh, this is the Rolling Stone article from 1972. The Alto was not yet working. By the way, I, I may have cornered the market. I picked up two copies of this 40-year-old edition still around on eBay. There's one left today that I saw that's 100 bucks, but I got the two cheaper ones. Uh, this, is, this is Bob Taylor. This is Alan Kay. This is a cardboard mock-up of the vision of the Dyna book. This is the beanbag room at Park. For extra credit, you can try to find me. I am in this picture. You can't read it, but these pictures were taken by the Rolling Stones photographer, Annie Leibowitz. But yeah, that was really cool. And the most important thing here, this is Stuart Brand at an early system. This is pre-Alto, and I'll come back to this later. That's an SRI mouse in his hand. This is a 
bitmap display being driven by this rack of equipment back here, which is the research character generator. And this was in 1972, which as I said, if you're looking for a marker, that's seven years before the demo to Apple. Um, so as I said, I want to highlight a little more. We have seen a lot of the Alto graphical user interface, the most visually impactful element of it. We've seen live demos of five programs. I'm going to run through just a static list to give you a little more feel for the breadth of applications that were built. Now, some of these we've seen pieces of. Uh, you saw in, in the actual use of the machine that the standard exec was really a line-oriented interface, but Neptune was really, think of this as a proto finder that it allowed you to list, you could select um, files on here for copying or deletion. It was a little bit of an evolutionary dead end. It's a point and click interface, but not a drag and drop interface. So you can select these things and cause it to, to do things on the file system. Uh, Gypsy has been mentioned a number of times, a superb piece of work by Larry Tesler, who I think is here, and Tim Mott, who I don't think could join us. Again, built on the underpinnings of Bravo, but it also had a layout capability and was really driven by the needs of the publishing industry and brought us the the modeless editing, which, and, and of course, those of you who know Larry, his license plate for many years was no modes. Um, <laughs> sorry, Larry. Uh, Sil was a simple illustrator. This is another graphics program that was written by Chuck Thacker. It, it really only had horizontal and vertical lines and little templates and icons. Now, these happened to be integrated circuits. And the reason this was important is it was really the first step in a computer-aided engineering system that allowed you to feed this into a series of applications which would produce uh, net lists and other things that were required in order to actually produce hardware from the design system. Um, now we've seen the bitmap fonts that were required and if you're going to do WYSIWYG editing in Bravo you need to have some fonts and this is an incredibly challenging problem. This is sort of a nominal font design system but you need a bunch of software to go with it. It's got a display, it's got a camera so you can look at some images and an alto. So some of the software that's required here, this is a system uh, that was called Fred, also built by Patrick. Here we're seeing an image of the merger of a video image of a character that you're then trying to outline with the splines, similar to what you saw in Bob's demo. You can take those and you get an outline, and this is important because when you first, we first started, you had bitmap fonts in a particular size and bold or italic, and it was an incredible burden to try to say how are we gonna have a family of fonts, and to get an abstract size independent representation with a bunch of splines allowed you to then say, oh, I'm gonna have a family of fonts, I can scale them, I can tilt them to make them italics, and convert these using a separate program, pre-pressed done by Bob Sproul, which would then allow you to turn these into the bitmap fonts that you're going to need either for the display at a coarser resolution or for the printers at a higher resolution. Um, Icarus, we saw a little bit about this earlier, was an integrated circuit design program for laying out ICs. This is an image from a paper from approximately 40 years ago. And courtesy of Dick Lyon, this is an Icarus design from a month ago using the same software on an Alto, which I'm told is a ring oscillator, but I'm a software guy, I wouldn't know. Um, <laughs> and finally, not a second to last, of course you have to have a game. This is an early game, which is Pinball, this is the ball moving through here with a little bit of a ghost behind it. Uh, flippers down here, this was done by some guys in microcode with a physics engine to make it all work. And finally, back on the more official side, some of the uh, work that was done on document preparation systems known as the Japanese document system and the Japanese office information system. This is a screenshot, again, showing regular text combined with Japanese text, and we'll see how this gets printed a little later. So, um, but that was, again, a flyover of eight static one slide, and, and, and let me apologize now to all of my friends in the room whose work I didn't happen to pick, and if I got the attributions wrong, all I can do is apologize and tell you I'll do better next time, if there was the next time. Um, now, beyond the graphical user interface is where things get really interesting, and I'm only gonna be able to spend a few minutes on this. We've seen some of the applications, but the Alto, and its software GUI was only a small part of this much broader contribution of system software and really a paradigm for distributed personal, com personal computing or the network. So the GUI is the tip of the iceberg, supporting the Alto hardware and its software. Of course, there was a local area network. We haven't hardly said anything about the Ethernet, which of course you know, deserves its entire sessions on it. But even more importantly, a full network architecture, an array of network servers to support it. And if you were dazzled by 
all of the demonstrations, the graphical user interface, the bitmaps, and everything else. Don't feel bad if you didn't see the rest of the iceberg because you're not the only person. At the height of Apple's early success in December 1979, Jobs, then all of 24, had a privileged invitation to visit Xerox Park. And they showed me really uh, three things. But I was so blinded by the first one that I didn't even really see the other two. Uh, one of the things they showed me was object-oriented programming. They showed me that, but I didn't even see that. The other one they showed me was really a networked computer system. They had over 100 Alto computers, all networked, using email, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't even see that. I was so blinded by the first thing they showed me, which was the graphical user interface. I thought it was the best thing I had ever seen in my life. I don't, I don't know how to say it any better. <laughs> the best thing we'd seen in our life. So let's set aside the GUI for a moment, talk a little bit about some of the other elements of system programming, object-oriented programming, and then the network environment. Uh, a few comments about the system software. The Alto, as you've seen, uh, had microcode. It allowed it to emulate a fairly typical 16-bit mini computer of its time, a Data General Nova. Most of the hardware was, software was originally written in BCPL. It's a, a precursor to C. If you can read C, you can read BCPL. It had a single-user OS. It had some interesting characteristics of the way the debugger worked, the disk format. had a, enough information on the disk that if you deleted the directory, you had enough extra information on the disk that you could reconstruct the directory. I don't recommend that you do this on your PC or your Mac today. Um, <laughs> In addition to the programming for BCPL, we saw there were the bytecode emulators for Smalltalk, object-oriented integrated language and environment, which of course is what Steve was selling. When that video was done, he was at Next before he had returned uh, to Apple. And then later, Mesa, which was a strongly typed system programming language. So a lot of work in building the software infrastructure for, building, for large systems programming. But then came the problem of interconnecting all of these machines. You sort of get one machine, and as soon as you have more than one, you have to figure out what to do. We did have the Ethernet. There were some early Ethernet-specific protocols that would work on one network. The Ethernet file transfer protocol was a very simple one packet at a time. You could use it to send something to the printer. But you very quickly realized that this is not going to work when you have multiple, you know, dozens, hundreds, thousands of machines on multiple Ethernets. And so you need what everybody knew was learning that you needed. It was an internetwork architecture. Uh, in our case, based on what was called the Park Universal Packet, or PUP. This was developed at about the same time and in parallel with other well-known efforts, including what TCP, which became TCP IP, an in-wig effort in Europe, with the same basic underlying ideas of an abstract internet datagram with encapsulation for transfer through a particular network. But you had to go build it if you were going to make it work. And the heavy lifting on this is done. I think Ed Taft is here, and I'm not sure if Dave Boggs is. They were really the guys who, who carried much of the, of the work here. And this is sort of the abstract layering. Most people have seen drawings like this before, an abstract um, layer, definition of a pop, individual network drivers down here, uh, layers of protocols for packets, for reliable byte stream interfaces, a whole architecture that you need. Uh, the first thing, but when you start to do this, you have to start building out the actual servers that are going to be the other side of the client machines. And the first server you need is the gateway itself, what we would today call a router. So it needs the internet routing, how to move the packets around, but it's much more than that. You need the routing table maintenance, the individual that, that updates the routing tables, the boot server that will dispense a boot to a machine that has no disk, a name server, a time server, test server, memory testing, and others. These were all pieces of the initial gateway, again, what we'd call a router. Uh, this picture, I'm afraid, is a fake because I can't, if anybody has one, I have not been able to find a photograph of a real PUP gateway, but this is the same type of machine. It's a Data General uh, mini computer with two Diablo disks in it. So it is, to the first order, the original internet router. Um, this is a, a diagram of the PUP network in May of 78. So again, compared to a marker, this is a year and a half before the visit by Apple to uh, Xerox in Palo Alto. And you'll see here each of these horizontal lines is an Ethernet. Several of them are in Palo Alto. Several of them are in Southern California. This one is in uh, Rochester, New York. These are internet work gateways, backbone lines, other connections, printers, and so on. Uh, this system built out a couple years later. The later version of this drawing takes about 10 pages to show all of the systems that were interconnected on the PUP network. Uh, one example within it of a particular uh, transport mechanism that we used, 
Uh, we cooperated with uh, ARPA's uh, Bay Area Packet Radio, which was mainly being used to read your email while the truck was dr driving up and down the freeway. We used it as an internet link uh, between two buildings in Palo Alto. So if you look at this half rack of equipment and you squint and you apply 30 or 40 years of Moore's Law, you get a wireless access point. Um, <laughs> Uh, now, so you have the, in, the servers for taking care of routing and moving packets around. Of course, a really important area is printing. Uh, it was Xerox, and we weren't actually going to do away with paper. There was a series of machines that I'll talk about. The LDX was the antecedent long distance serography, XGP slot, years, and others. Um, let me just jump in here. So this is a, a precursor to the scanning uh, uh, xerographic printers. This was a machine called the LDX, the Long Distance Xerography. Believe it or not, this is, these two things together are a fax machine. Each one is about the size of a refrigerator. This is a scanner. This is a printer. These were used in very specialized applications. I think some three-letter agencies used them. But this device had basically a xerographic copier. In it. This is not a laser printer. This has a CRT which is at about the extreme of the amount of light it can get. It was unbelievably slow. Um, but if you took this half of the LDX, it was converted into an XGP, which was one of the first raster scan printers. And those of you who know Tom Malloy should ask him about his first job at Xerox and how, what it had to do with the XGP. Uh, you find out very quickly that the scanning CRT and a really slow engine are really not a great combination. And the right answer at that time in an effort uh, really championed by Gary Starkweather, uh, was the laser printer. And it uh, uses, in, in this case, this is a uh, Xerox 7000. I, I'm pretty sure this is the original one. This is the Xerox 7000 engine. This was important because it had a red-sensitive photoreceptor, which was important because this is a red helium neon or Heaney laser with a modulator, mirrors. There's a spinning multifaceted mirror here, and the image dives down. You saw the schematic earlier. I have no idea what this cost at the time. This must have been a couple hundred thousand dollars, perhaps, to build this. Uh, today, in a laser printer, those parts probably cost about five bucks. And, um, but if you take, you know, that's only part of it. That's the marking engine. Uh, this is Tim Mott in a uh, screen snap in a, from a, a video. And this is the first prototype laser printer, which is ears. So this part is the slot. That's the output. This is the 7000 engine. This is that optical table up here. And hiding behind here is the rest that makes it a print server. This is where the Ethernet, the Alto, and the research character generator, which we saw in the picture with, uh, with Stuart Brand earlier, turns this into a network print server of the first generation. Um, and in addition to printing English language text, this isn't a very good picture, but it's the only one I had. You can see this is what you see is what you get in a memo from Bill English with some embedded Japanese uh, within it. That was the first generation. This is the second generation known as the Dover, a development effort uh, that was led by John Ellenby, and one of these is, is in the museum's collection. This again has the 7000 engine. This is the paper output, but that large optical bench that was on top has been reduced into a package that fits down into the machine. And this was then shared with, uh, these were installed at a number of universities and experimental sites, and many of us printed our PhD theses on this. Um, so the next generation of server, the next uh, set of servers that one needs are file servers, places to store things. In the protocol architecture, we built a file transfer protocol on top of PUP. Multiple generations of file servers. We had a main machine, sort of like a PDP-10, but also something called the Woodstock file server, which was a page at a time, really like a remote disk. And what was supposed to be the interim file server, which lasted for a really long time. And by the way, there's a dump of an IFS that's available through the uh, Computer History Museum that was shared by, uh, by Xerox. Uh, one of the things I'll mention here is the, you know, the experience with that earlier set of inner network routing protocols, time protocols, booting, and other things, simple things at that level, and the Woodstock file server what was one of the things that convinced us that you really needed this layered architecture that included packet access as well as reliable streams. What people forget is the first three versions of the TCP protocol, at least in the paper designs, only had a reliable stream interface. They had no packet level interface. And we weren't the only ones, but we and many others kept working with them and saying, no, 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 you're missing what you need here. You're missing what you need here. And it was only in, as we all know, Rev4 that the IP layer was split out from the TCP layer in the uh, protocols, which are what we all use on the internet and the web today. 
another set of services was in Packet Voice. Some early experience, experiments used an A to D and D to A converter in the Alto. So the Alto was the entire compute engine. A later version, and this is led, I think some of this by Dan Swinehart, who I think is here, Larry Stewart and others, uh, did a dedicated box, which was an ether phone that would sit between your handset and it would integrate with the handset and the ethernet and allow you to do voice applications over the network. Um, it looked something like this. So that's now a scaled down computer and a phone and a speaker. And again, if you squint at that through 30 years, that becomes a SIP phone, an internet phone. But you have to squeeze it down a little bit. Uh, some other applications and servers, this is uh, work on worm programs. These were distributed computations that would allow you to harness machines on the network to try to do applications. And another example of network services was, of course, you have to end with games. This is a multi-machine game. This is Maze War, uh, which was played across different machines. It's shown here in two adjacent ones. We thought for the demo tonight that we might get ambitious and try to see if we couldn't hook up between here and the LCM in Seattle, and we decided that was a step too far. But uh, <laughs> it, uh, it was great fun. So let, let me just wrap up you know, that the Alto itself, the hardware and software, were, as Chuck said, a powerful platform for software development, GUI-based applications. But more than that, it was a piece of a broader client-server architecture, which really led to this notion of distributed personal computing. Uh, my friends here at the Computer History Museum really get frustrated with me when I try to ask the question of what was the first of something. This is always a very complicated question. And they explain to me that you need the right qualifiers and you need the right adjectives in order to really defend something. But I'm gonna defer to the IEEE, which in honoring Chuck Thacker, described him as the architect of the first modern personal computer, which is what I think we've really seen here today. Thank you all very much. Um, Thank you. And thank you very much. And I think we have one final video about the restoration efforts that led to us, uh, led us to the point where we could show you these machines. At Xerox Park, the people involved with um, building the Alto and building the Alto software often talked about the Alto as a time machine, not in the sense of something from the past that has come to the present, but in the sense that they were building in their present, the early 1970s, a computer that they thought would become much more economically and technologically practical 10 years in the future. So they were building then the computer of tomorrow. So for now, from the perspective of 40 years on, the Alto is yesterday's computer of tomorrow that we have restored for us to benefit from exploring in our today. The Alto project started in March of 2017. The restoration took about eight months of very dedicated work on software curator Al Caso's time. Basically, the, the electronics are you know, relatively modern, 1970s uh, integrated circuits. So the boards themselves uh, mostly work. The restoration of two Altos began as part of the Center for Software History's Alto System Project. The problem for Al was not getting the machines actually running, but really making sure all the peripherals were connected and operational and all the components didn't give out on him unexpectedly. For the network, I just tried booting over the network and it came right up, but it wouldn't boot off the disk drive. It, it just didn't make sense why you could transmit between the two machines and only in one direction to the other one. So I kept thinking, you know, is, is it the cabling, is it, is it the interface cards, and, but it, yeah, it turned out that it was actually a problem with the, with the modern card. It's no doubt that Al's eight-month quest to restore these cool machines has been challenging. There's a paper uh, cylinder that's supposed to be there and it actually burned up. So one of the most important players in this, besides Al, was volunteer Paul McJones. All I needed to do was to go back to the 
backup tape format from 40 years ago and write a program to convert them into modern files and directories and web pages and open files that are source code or um, word processor files for Bravo, which was the first WYSIWYG text editor, and that's what I did. It's really just fascinating to see how intricate and involved and dedicated everybody was on the project. Well, we've been given a dispensation to go to 8.55, which uh, gives us about 10 minutes of questions. But um, before we get into that, I really must say, won't you join me in giving Al Caso a round of applause for the wonderful <laughs> restoration of the Alto. Uh, there's uh, just a fascinating stack of questions here from the audience, so I think I'll forego a question of my own and turn to, to one of theirs. And a uh, very simple, very interesting question. What's the most important feature of the Alto that's missing from today's systems? Anyone, att anyone want to attempt that? Replay. <laughs> <laughs> very good. <laughs> Shifted yes. selection. Which we saw, and Dan? Um, well, I, f I felt that having microcode available on the Alto was great. Now, a lot of that happens now with, with caching in modern computers. But having a, a very finite resource in which everything may run 10 times faster is incredibly motivating as, a, as an architect. Because it says you've got to figure out something that's simple and general um, and, and put your energy there, and then it will serve everywhere else at, at increased performance. I, I completely agree. I mean, uh, our machines might be 10,000 times bigger, but they don't seem to be 10,000 times better. Mm. <laughs> That's because of software bloat, Charles. <laughs> no, I agree. I agree. That's, that's the implication, yes. Shall we move to another question? Um, this too I thought was extremely interesting. What was your idea generating process like? Or, or perhaps the creative and collaborative process at Park, if any of you can give some texture to that. So one of the things you mentioned in one of the videos was, in fact it was you, Charles, mentioned that you saw some pieces of paper on Butler's desk. So Butler had an incredible knack, still does, but certainly did then, of getting the germ of an idea, and then, in Tom Sawyer fashion, getting others to actually do the work. <laughs> Charles, Charles was the, no, no, this, was, this was not a bad thing at all. Oh. It was a great Lampson amplifier. Yes. And Charles was the first victim. I was a victim, the, the, um, the image generator for the Dover, um, Severo Ornstein, who's here tonight, and I did, because of a suggestion from Butler. And I can still actually remember the meeting in which that happened. Butler would occasionally get this kind of far away look in which he detached totally from what was going on in the meeting around him. And he'd start scribbling on a piece of paper. And you knew you were in trouble when that started. <laughs> and he had a very nice handwriting, very legible. <laughs> Doug? On the Laurel project, we had a super user. He wrote no code. His name was Jim Horning. And he used every inch of Laurel and kept coming up with hundreds of suggestions of how to improve it. And we gave him rapid turnaround on, on uh, implementing these ideas. And we were able to watch the system evolve into something much better than the people actually building it could ever have done by themselves. Anyone else? Dan. I'll give you a backwards one, which is uh, Ted Taylor and I designed an object-oriented virtual memory. Because as it was mentioned here, there's very little space in an Alto, really, for doing general processing. Um, and we came up with this design, and we, and we walked Butler through it. Alan said, you ought to go talk to Butler about this. So we did that. And at the end, he said, you'll never get it to work. <laughs> and that got us going. And, 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 and it served two generations of small talk. Um, perhaps related to this question is uh, 
is the fact that everybody was using these tools uh, for their work in the uh, research center. Would anybody like to characterize, you know, what that was like or, or about that process? Well, it's not, not, not just everybody, but everybody and their spouses used the system, and that was the, just the incorporation of, of civilians, if you will, <laughs> for, the, for the first time. I think that was very motivating. Well, well, Charles and I never had trouble getting feedback about Bravo <laughs> because there were so many uh, users. Uh, and we didn't have what you would think of as modern software uh, engineering infrastructure. We didn't have a, a QA group and, right. and things like that. So um, we would put out a, a version and uh, then we would get feedback very quickly. Yeah, we would get the replays. That's what we would, we would get. get the replays. I think. think, right. I, think oh, poor son. <laughs> I think. No, go ahead. I think. Oh. we were demonstrating seven tonight. <laughs> I have Bob and then John. So I think it was another aspect too, which is everybody was motivated to really make these prototypes work. They were much more robust prototypes than most prototypes. When the printer was down, you knew it, <laughs> and if you were responsible for it, you fixed it. John. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that the, the, the funny correlate, unfortunately, on friends and family coming in to use the machines is, as, as some of you know, we heard recently here at the Computer History Museum, the original business plan for the Mac was written by a friend of a Xerox researcher who came into Park to write the plan on the Alto and print it on the Dover. <laughs> like, talk about cosmic irony. Also, evidently, the screenplay for Tron. Yes. <laughs> um, any other? Thoughts? Okay. Um, when did it become okay for C-level executives to type? <laughs> Anybody have any thoughts about just that? Uh, I guess that relates to perhaps the experience of Futures Day. Well, it, it, it really depends on, on um, how easy it was to get these results that were so desirable. And I. The prediction, of course, was that, that executives would never type. Mm -hmm. That was a marketing prediction, and, and we didn't believe in that. I would have to say the answer is long after our time. Okay. Uh, again, uh, uh, <laughs> moving from the specific to the philosophical, uh, what do you wish you knew then at Park doing this work? Perhaps an unfair question. Going once, going twice. Okay. I, wait a minute. Oh. Oh, um, <laughs> so um, when Alan Kay came to us with his prototype of, of, of his dream, of, that, uh, that was a, a machine with a small keyboard and a flat panel that was about this big, and it had the power of a PDP-10, I thought that he was crazy. <laughs> and, and we never quite believed in Moore's law to the extent that it came true. Mm -hmm. That's true. So. Uh, well then, I, I'd like to ask you all a question about the, the high resolution screen of the Xerox Alto, which has been quite literally the focus of our event this evening. Um, it slight, strikes me that, only exaggerating slightly, the focus of the Alto hardware was this screen, and the point of the software was to make use of it. How important do you think this high-resolution screen was to the historical influence or impact of the Alto system? Doug. It was fundamental because you could have real type on the screen. You saw it with Bravo. You saw it with Laurel. That text that went on the screen was beyond anything you saw on a computer ever. And that is what sold it more than anything. We, we saw graphics in other precursor machines, but the way you could manipulate type was beyond everyone's understanding. Well, I would say that it's uh, the um Resolution is not that important, and the fact that it was a raster display, mm. and also that there was raster pointing with the mouse. Mm -hmm. And with a raster uh, pointing and raster display, you could display uh, virtually anything. Yeah, well, so I, I side with 
with Doug. I, I think resolution did matter. Um, raster displays were around, and, and even the first PC had, was a raster display, right? Well, and look where it went. Well, yes, but it started out at resolutions that were unusable for the kinds of applications you saw this evening. And, and a completely different class of things looked feasible at this kind of resolution. It was a long time before alto resolution made it to the PC. Well, perhaps we will squeeze in one, one final question. Um, the Alto was the realization of the Vision at Park of personal distributed computing, and I'd like you all to focus on distributed for a moment. Uh, while local and distant networking was fundamental to the Alto system, it seems like it took 15 or 20 years before networking really became integral to personal computing as it developed more broadly. Do you have any thoughts about why there was that, that lag? Bob. So everybody was so excited about it, they made proprietary and incompatible standards. And in, until the networking really became ubiquitous enough and so that you could interoperate, so that heterogeneous collections of machines could talk to one another, um, it didn't take off. Now, we didn't have that problem at part because we built all the machines. <laughs> but the instant you got to real markets out there, competitors building different machines, the, the, the interconnected, the, the ability to talk to each other went away if you were on proprietary networks. Mm -hmm. Charles. Interesting enough, there's a law about this. It's called Metcalf's Met Law. <laughs> <laughs> and Bob Metcalf, of course, is the uh, creator of uh, Ethernet. Right, right. But it's, it's Metcalf's, law, it's Metcalf's Law basically says that, um, uh, what does it say? <laughs> <laughs> How are the network goes up square the number of uh, exactly. nodes? Exactly. So that applies. Thank you. Any other thoughts on that one? Well, perhaps this is a great time for everyone to join me in thanking all of our presenters this evening. Thank you very much.